Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Manish Nakpal, and it's a great pleasure to be uh, with all of you here. It's always a pleasure to collaborate with Orbis and reach out to so many of you across uh, different countries. And today I would be talking to you uh, about retinal detachment and PVR, its management, the surgical approaches, uh, the technical uh, aspects, uh, as well as the various uh, advances which take place over the years uh, in how we manage these situations. So when we talk of retinal detachment, uh, it occurs in many different uh, types in terms of uh, the location, the size, uh, bullous, non-bullous, uh, macula on, macula off, and there's a lot of different aspects to it. And the various uh, management aspects are scleral buckling, which has been there as a gold standard uh, for the longest time ever. And then pneumoretinopexy, which works in a few specific cases where there is a superior break, single break. Uh, with a bullous element with no other breaks existing inferiorly. And of course, the most common approach today as we stand is vitrectomy. Uh, I'll take you through these approaches uh, in terms of, and the, first of all, we'll discuss uh, vitrectomy as, uh, because that's what is most commonly done today. There's a choice of gauges in, with which we operate uh, all these cases. And for me, the personal uh, preferred choice is 25 gauge because it's a great balance between what we used to do uh, in a 20 gauge surgery in the past. Uh, and now uh, you have almost up to 27 gauge, but the instrumentation, uh, the stiffness of the instruments, uh, the way we can manage oil injections, removals, I think uh, it's a good balance uh, between a large gauge uh, and the smallest gauge available as of today. But as advances take place, we move from 20, 23, 25, uh, a lot of people use 27. So, so I guess as the technology improves, maybe uh, the smallest would always become the best at some point of time. So when we manage a case of detachment with vitrectomy, our first aim is to remove the vitreous. And, and this is a case of a detachment where uh, there is a pre-existing uh, hyaloid. Uh, the detachment has already taken place. Uh, because you could have a situation where the hyaloid is still stuck. So the, both are managed differently. And this is an example of how we start a vitrectomy. Uh, the hyaloid is not attached here. So uh, all we do is remove the vitreous from all the areas 360 degrees. This is being, which is being removed from near the break. Uh, and in this case, we don't have to go and specially remove the hyaloid. As against this situation, which you see here, where the hyaloid is uh, well stuck on the mobile retina, uh, we have stained it with triamcinolone so that uh, it makes it easy for us to identify the plane uh, and so that we can see the vitreous better, also see the plane of retina, and it avoids an inadvertent uh, touch of the retina and iatrogenic break, and also make sure that we know how it is uh, uh, detaching, peeling from the retina uh, to ensure that we do a complete uh, PVD uh, properly. And once the retina is mobile, uh, it can become a little difficult because uh, as we pull uh, the vitreous, the retina also moves. So, so one has to constantly uh, engage the vitreous and move it tangentially in a way that uh, the, the retina does not interfere uh, with that removal process. And so this is a classic example of how uh, we remove in an in a, in a eye which has a mobile retina with the attached hyaline. When we remove vitreous, uh, sometimes in uh, fakey eyes with clear lenses, it's difficult to go to the periphery. And uh, in, in some of these cases, we would uh, use indentation from outside so that uh, we don't have to go uh, as much to the periphery with the shaft of the instruments touching the lens. So we try to bring the periphery closer to the uh, center uh, in, avoid, in order to avoid a lens touch. So, so if you have a clear lens and uh, you have a detachment and you want to remove the peripheral vitreous as far as you can without touching the lens, uh, this is a great way to do it. Of course, you may need to have either an assistant indenting for you or uh, you could have a chandelier light as in this case we have used uh, so that you can yourself use your uh, other hand to indent and be independent of the uh, assistant holding it for indenting for you. So either way you could uh, choose to do in these cases. This is the pre and the post uh, operative view of this patient uh, whose video I showed you uh, just before this. So once we have removed the vitreous and the eye is free of the vitreous, we do an air fluid exchange. Uh, this brings up a bulla. As you can see, 
I'll I'll go back and show this to you again. Uh, we've brought in air. The fluid is gone, and the bullas come up because all the fluid is pushed to the uh, under the retinal surface to the existing brakes. If you in this case you see superiorly, and once that happens, we go to the brake and then drain from. Uh, and the endo drainage is done. You could do it uh, with the cutter itself because they are pretty fine gauge these days. Or you could use a soft tip, uh, whatever one modality. And you see the reflex of the tessellated background of the retina coming back as soon as the fluid goes away and the retina goes back uh, into its place. Now, at times, what happens that uh, after the air fluid exchange, the fluid collects posteriorly and the brake is uh, uh, very anterior. Uh, in that case, I use perfluorocarbon to push this fluid peripherally. And now you can see that uh, as the perfluorocarbon has pushed the fluid to the peripheral part, I can drain easily from the brake. Otherwise, I may have needed to make a separate uh, retinotomy posteriorly to drain this fluid. So PFCL is, is extremely useful for, for such a situation. This is, again, to emphasize on the same situation. Uh, we, we are doing a vitrectomy. You see a temporal detachment with a temporal break. And at the end of air fluid exchange, uh, the, the, we put perfluorocarbon and push the fluid. And after that, uh, flatten the retina with, uh, with, with uh, endo drainage and then done an endo laser. Now, if the macula is on, uh, you want to make sure the macula never detaches. Suppose you do an air fluid exchange, the bulla may come to the macular area. So in that case, I use perfluorocarbon before doing the air fluid exchange. So once you've done a good vitrectomy, uh, cleaned up, don't do an air fluid exchange right away in such cases. Put perfluorocarbon uh, up to the equator or up to the edges of the existing brake so that that much retina uh, remains uh, stable. And I'll show that to you again. So I'm put injecting perfluorocarbon so that the macula remains attached uh, throughout uh, the case and we never give it a chance to be detached inadvertently because we don't want to disturb uh, those crucial uh, aspects of the retinal architecture uh, due to these um, uh, exchanges. And once again, we push the fluid to the periphery and, and then we are draining from those existing inferior breaks in this case. So uh, retina will flatten without uh, the macula ever getting detached in such a case. So it's very important to recognize uh, these differences for these cases. And then, of course, we do endolaser to uh, most of these cases. Once you finish the, the surgery, uh, once you finish the vitrectomy, endo drainage, retina is flat. You do a, a good laser uh, as a retinopexy to end, this, end the case. Sometimes I use cryo. If the break is extremely peripheral, small, and, and, in, and especially in the superior between uh, about 10 to 1 o'clock quadrants, at times a very small break, can be difficult to reach with the laser at times. And I, I, I just pick up my cryo and, and indent it, and you can see very easily uh, how the cryo comes on this horseshoe tear, which otherwise is uh, difficult to visualize sometimes in uh, high myopic eyes and all. Uh, uh, so I pick up a cryo at times. This is always a good option to keep. Uh, of course, endo laser is there. Some people can also use a bino laser at times, uh, get up and do a laser. But um, so these are the options to do retinopexy uh, once you've finished that aspect uh, of the situation. A couple of cases to show you some uh, additional aspects. So this case has a posterior break, as you can see near the cutter, and also a macular hole. So in this case, we aim to peel the, the ILM. And as you can see, I've stained it with uh, brilliant blue and uh, I'm picking it up with an ILM forceps. Uh, and gradually the ILM gets peeled. Sometimes with detached retina, uh, one has to be careful and always move the forceps from the disc uh, to away instead of uh, uh, coming towards the disc because otherwise the mobile retina will keep uh, pulling it. Then, of course, I put in perfluorocarbon to flatten the posterior pole, just like I showed you uh, in the previous cases, so that the fluid gets pushed to the brake. Uh, and, and then drain it from the break, and after that do an endo laser. You can see the ILM peel central area in this case, uh, and then put the uh, gas uh, at the end of surgery. Now this is a case with uh, uh, large ragged tears with uh, inverted edges, uh, bridging vessels, as you can see in the superior break. And um, we are doing a vitrectomy at this stage to clear up uh, and loosen up the retina from all aspects. You can also see uh, uh, which is hemorrhage resolving inferiorly admixed with the vitreous. So our first aim is to clear up uh, everything 
because there's a bridging vessel, I would uh, make sure I diathermize the tip so that if it gets cut uh, uh, during the vitrectomy, I don't want a bleeder starting. Uh, so, and then I put perfluorocarbon to stabilize the posterior pole. As you can see, uh, I, I bring it up gradually to the edges of the brake and then uh, go on top of it also because uh, I know that there's no traction here and, and, and gradually it would allow me to see uh, passively flatten this retina uh, quite well. And then the ragged edges I'm flattening with the help of a atraumatic instrument uh, we call the massager. We use it for macular holes typically, but I also use it for uh, these kind of maneuvers wherever I need an instrument which is atraumatic uh, to be moved over the retinal surface uh, it, just to help uh, bring back those folds uh, and flatten it as far as possible uh, in this situation. So the retina looks uh, well flat. Uh, these, these maneuvers are best done by zooming in uh, so that you can see the details better rather than working on a low magnification. But of course, every case we do is on a wide field imaging, uh, wide field viewing uh, so that you can see the best all around. After that, do a good endo laser. These are large tears, ragged tears, uh, very prone to PVR, as you can see, but we've removed the vitreous, flattened them as far as possible uh, to give them the best chance of uh, a remaining flat postoperatively. This is again, uh, something similar uh, that you can see mobile retina, uh, uh, large tears superiorly and some other smaller tears inferiorly. So these kind of multiple tears will always happen with an acute occurrence of PVD in a patient and that would pull open multiple tears like these. So you can see that we are removing the vitreous carefully, uh, removing it from the edges of the break uh, as far as possible. Uh, and, and then once we are sure that the vitreous is gone, uh, we flatten the posterior pole. I always like to use perfluorocarbon, as you would see, I, I'm repeating it again and again because it's a great passive tool and I feel uh, we should use it for a lot of our cases as an adjunct. Uh, it also uh, allows you to uh, keep the posterior pole really stable while you work in the periphery. And, and then of course you um, uh, do the same thing. You drain from the periphery from these breaks. Uh, there are multiple ill-form lattices here, which you can see. And then of course, uh, uh, do a good laser uh, to these areas uh, at the end of surgery. In multiple tears, I always like to do a 360 laser. And, and uh, most of the times, if there are multiple tears spanning, I would put oil and we remove it at three to four months, five months based on how the eye is behaving. Now, let me take you to uh, uh, the other aspect of the scleral buckling, uh, which, which is done for certain kind of cases. That used to be the gold standard for all retinal detachment surgeries in the past, but now uh, is lost art. Uh, I don't think buckling will survive. Uh, another five, seven, ten years because it's a dying art. Uh, we are fortunate to have uh, learned it in our times and we still practice it in, in a certain number of our cases, but all of us are getting more and more comfortable uh, with vitrectomy now just because the way the technology, the viewing, everything is improving. So uh, what we did is that to improve the viewing and, and the ability to teach, uh, we combined the benefits of viewing with vitrectomy based lenses and do the classic scleral buckling. So you can see that this is the Vogue SSV uh, lenses are the ones that I use for contact-based wide field viewing. You could also be using your non-contact viewing, uh, whatever biome or whatever wide field lenses that you use, and then use classic scleral buckling. And we uh, uh, were one of the first few people to bring this concept. And I, I, I talked about it at the whale meeting in, in 2013 initially, and slowly it has become uh, quite popular, especially with teaching-based hospitals where uh, one has to teach scleral buckling uh, as it's getting to be a dying art nowadays. So what we do is classically put a chandelier light, as you can see here, we've opened the eye, uh, taken the muscles, just like you would do for classic buckling, put a chandelier. And, and this is the view that you would get uh, because the, the view is the same as what you would get with a vitrectomy. So I'll show you a couple of clips. This is a case of a uh, detachment, myopic detachment, uh, inferiorly extending temporal, the break is temporal. You can see that we are doing the indentation. This is just like how you would see with indirect ophthalmoscopy, except that the view is much better, much more magnified. You can zoom in, then we are doing cryo uh, uh, to that area. 
after that you localize the break and and take the sutures uh, pass the sutures uh, externally after localizing we use a sponge uh, in, in uh, what we prefer then do a drainage with a needle uh, you can see the fluid coming out uh, from the infrotemporal area which we localized uh, and once the fluid has come out, we check inside and you can see the retina is uh, flat uh, inside. And then we've tightened the buckle and, and the buckle effect is seen. So, so this is a classic buckling procedure, except that you see it better. It's great for teaching uh, purposes. So, so this is just a sequential uh, uh, pictures of a case of how you would do a, a localized cryo. Uh, and, and after that, you, you, you drain, uh, you, you localize, and then take a suture externally. After that, you drain, uh, and then you see the buckle effect. So, so this is how uh, we've been using uh, the combination of advantage of the viewing systems of vitrectomy with a classic buckling surgery. One more clip to show you uh, inferior detachment with uh, uh, peripheral breaks, which is a classic indication for, for buckling. These are more often uh, young, young people with traumatic uh, origins at times. And so you can see that we have zoomed in, you can see the break very well, you see the cryo coming in, uh, the reaction uh, as it comes in and then it thaws uh, and then completes the reaction on over the break. Uh, so you can zoom in and appreciate these uh, much better than what you see with indirect and it's easy to teach. Once again, we are localizing uh, with this external diathermy after that drain with a needle, you see the, the fluid coming out, viscous in nature, uh, because of long-standing nature of a lot of these inferior detachments. And uh, we are clearing up the fluid externally, keep the pressure uh, with the back of the forceps. And once uh, you're satisfied with the drainage, you look inside and you can see a very good buckle effect, uh, which has come. The cryoed holes are seen uh, on top of, the buckle effect is seen on top of them. So this is uh, a desirable buckle at the end. So we had published data on, uh, this initially in 2013, and then, uh, of course, in Retina Today, as well as Retina Times, and uh, a lot of institutes uh, abroad have started following this, and they, they, they like the idea of uh, using it so that they can teach it uh, uh, much more easily to the fellows, uh, because they can see how, how you localize, how you do cryo, how you do all the steps, which with the indirect becomes a great challenge. So everything is about uh, visualization uh, as far as uh, settling a retina is concerned, whether it's sterile buckling, whether it's vitrectomy, you need to make sure that your view is, uh, is, is good. So for, as far as the buckling is concerned, it would be very easy for a surgeon comfortable with vitrectomy-based visualization to adapt to this modality in case there is an indication for buckling. Better visualization with zooming capabilities and ability to transmit record surgery, uh, all that makes it a great uh, uh, tool for teaching uh, in short. Then let me come to uh, the PVR aspect, the proliferative vitreo retinopathy, which is something that always complicates uh, a lot of regmatogenous retinal detachments. Uh, maybe you see a patient with uh, existing PVR, maybe you see a fresh a detachment patient, you operate and then it fails because of PVR uh, or, or you've done a successful surgery and then the patient comes back with uh, PVR and leads to the failure of that surgery. There could be many uh, aspects to, to the PVR uh, area, and, and it's something that we don't know uh, everything about it in terms of prevention, but uh, we, we know uh, over a period of time, a lot of techniques, a lot of instrumentation is developed by which one can tackle it much more uh, atraumatically, much more delicately, uh, and then uh, to ensure that you can settle the retina again after the occurrence of PVR. Uh, we've been uh, contributing to the Ryan's Retina, the, the fifth edition, sixth edition you see here, and, and now there's an ongoing uh, process of the seventh edition going on where we've updated the chapter along with uh, various surgical videos which can be accessed uh, on this as well, with, of which some of them I'll be showing you uh, in the, the next few slides. So PVR can be uh, something as simple as a macular pucker. PVR is something where the, once the retina is detached, nature tries to uh, proliferate cells on top of it, under it, inside it, uh, in all layers, uh, trying its best to attach it. But in that process, it, it uh, is not able to uh, control its proliferation. And that's what leads to these 
uh, proliferations in membrane. So in this case, there's a detachment with the pucker. Uh, we've removed the pucker and now we've stained uh, uh, with the brilliant glue so that we can remove the ILM. Um, this uh, ILM removal in cases of uh, puckers and retinal detachment with puckers uh, is basically aimed at uh, trying to reduce the recurrence incidence. Uh, also, the scaffold on which the pucker grows back again, uh, you have removed it and also released the contraction to some more level. So, so it's always a good idea to do an ILM peeling in detachments with an existing pucker. Uh, there are a lot of surgeons who do ILM peeling for uh, almost all detachments. Personally, I do it only for those where I see a frank uh, pucker which I'm removing, or if I see a crenated, uh, ill-formed uh, pucker, uh, there I might stain and remove uh, these areas of ILM, but not for uh, a, a regular retinal detachment which does not have a pucker. Uh, we don't have data yet to say that uh, that is useful for regular detachments. So at this stage, I would recommend using it for uh, cases where there is a pucker. So in detached retina, sometimes ILM peeling can be difficult. In this case, we managed it uh, without the PFCL, but if suppose during the procedure you feel it's challenging, one can put perfluorocarbon and do it. So I, I keep it as a backup. Uh, in some cases, I'm able to remove it. I don't bother with it. In some cases, I would go ahead and put perfluorocarbon and, and peel under it uh, in this. So here, as you can see, there's pucker and extending radiating poles. So we finally settle it and then drain uh, and then after that, do a endo laser to that area in this situation. This is again another case. Here you don't see a, a well-formed pucker, as this is what I was telling you about. That you see radiating poles, you know there is something which is forming on the retina, but it's not a classic pucker which you saw in the previous case. So, so here you are better off um, staining and removing so that whatever element of uh, cells are proliferating over the surface of retina will will get removed once you remove the ILM. So here I'm extending it with perfluorocarbon's help uh, because I feel there is a contraction which is extending uh, beyond the macular area, a bit more temporal, uh, so that uh, the overall contraction of these poles uh, relaxes uh, in, in this case. But otherwise, typically I would stick to the macular area uh, as far as the peeling is uh, concerned in these cases. So the pucker is uh, removed as well as the ILM, uh, which is going off till towards the arcades. You can see uh, most likely it had a ill-formed pucker, which, which came off with the ILM, and then the retina looks uh, much better in the central area. Now, this is a thick pucker, uh, uh, which, is, which has got a radiating pole inferiorly. Now, this is because of post-traumatic. Uh, there was probably some uh, inferior area which had a contraction, which led to so the Central pucker is quite thick, as you can see, uh, and I had crumpled up the whole macular area, which, uh, to which we have removed. And after that, we are uh, doing a air fluid exchange to check for mobility because of that inferior fold. And as you can see, there's a break with uh, some contraction here. So as I'm trying to laser, I realize that I need to release this contraction. So I do a localized retinectomy uh, here at this stage, because otherwise this contraction uh, even though it it, it may uh, look fine right now, uh, and I, I may be able to do a laser by increasing the power, but then this is inferior and it's it's a potential area for uh, contraction post-operatively, and it would lead to a recurrence of PVR inferiorly. So you should always keep the retina um, as relaxed as possible uh, in these situations. Now, this is a case of detachment, again, uh, with not a classic PVR puckers that you see, but you see uh, a wrinkled retinal surface, which tells you that there are grades of uh, small ill-formed membranes uh, all around it, which are possibly there. So these are best tackled, again, with the help of a, a dye. You inject the dye, and then uh, typically I put PFCL. <laughs> Stano Rizzo from Italy had shown us this technique. So you put in the dye and then you inject PFCL. And under PFCL, uh, you look at these membranes which are finely stained. Uh, I use the finesse loop uh, at times for such type of cases. Uh, under PFCL, you can um, move over these ill-formed membranes and folds. And at times, you can find 
uh, the edges of these ill-formed membranes, which may help you release the contractions a bit better. So this is something uh, one could uh, take advantage of staining in, in certain type of cases where you don't see classic membranes uh, uh, away from the macula, but you see wrinkling and, and, and some folds uh, around it. So here, uh, as you can see, we've removed a few of these membranes also spanning over the macular area. Uh, and you can see that this is not just the eye line. You see uh, a thicker part component coming off with the stained uh, ILM that you're seeing here, which is basically membranes. So, so this is something which is useful uh, so that you, reach, you achieve a complete flattening of, of these areas. And after that, of course, an endo laser, uh, which is done the, to all the breaks which are there in the 360 barrage. This is the post-operative uh, picture of uh, this patient with oil inside. Now, this is a case, again, with PVR, and I put perfluorocarbon. And as you see, I peeled off the central part under perfluorocarbon. Now, this helps a lot because the, the, the perfluorocarbon instantly tells you that the traction has gone, you know, and, and your pucker is fully uh, removed and instantly stabilizes the posterior pole. And this is something you can do if, if there is no posterior break because if there is a pucker or a traction on the macula and you also have a posterior break, you can't put perfluorocarbon till you relax that traction. So whenever you don't have a posterior break and you have a pucker or track, traction without a break, Perfluorocarbon is a great tool to have uh, along. Like this case, again, there's a pucker. I'm, I'm putting in perfluorocarbon before removing the pucker uh, because I feel that it, it helps me. Uh, it it uh, tells me exactly where the traction is. And as I'm pulling it, it instantly also confirms that it, uh, the, the traction is relieved and I don't need to peel uh, anymore uh, in, in that situation. So this is uh, something that is extremely useful. So perfluorocarbon, I use it at multiple times uh, based on situations as I showed you for simple detachments. I use it uh, uh, at times to stabilize the posterior pole. If the macula is on, I always put it. Uh, if after air fluid exchange, I feel that the bullas have come, but uh, the, the fluid has come posteriorly and the break is peripherally, I would, I would uh, put some perfluorocarbon so that the fluid gets pushed to the periphery and I can drain easily without having to make another retinotomy. Now, this is a case of extensive PVR. You can see a shortening uh, on the sides. Uh, there's a uh, kind of a tangential circumferential fraction on the periphery. Uh, our aim is first to remove the vitreous uh, properly. Uh, you are, uh, because you need to do it 360 degrees as much uh, uh, free of vitreous as possible so that then you can assess the inherent contraction of the retina uh, after once you've finished that. You can see the viscous nature of the slurring the fluid which comes out, uh, it's, a, it's a good idea to aspirate some of it because it debulks the, the retina and allows you to work better in some of these cases. Uh, always use wide angle systems. You can see the periphery uh, very well. I use the woke ones uh, and, and you can go very close to the uh, retinal surface, uh, see the periphery, the attachments of the vitreous uh, very well. Uh, and then uh, of course, once you, have, you feel that there is a bit of relaxation, you put in perfluorocarbon. Now you see that there is definitely something in the posterior pole which is holding up the, the retina. Uh, we've removed the membranes, also peripheral membranes, which are circumferentially working. Uh, you could use a bimanual approach uh, because this is just a couple of membranes here. I sometimes just use the shaft of my light pipe to hold the retina while I'll pull it with the, with the forceps. Uh, but you could use uh, any multiple instruments uh, that, that one uh, prefers using uh, from your inventory. But the simplest way is to use the shaft of your light pipe because it can keep the retina at bay while you pull and relax this uh, whole circumferential component of uh, vitreous traction admixed with some blood that you see here. And slowly uh, the, the retina relaxes, although it's a 360 degree uh, tangential uh, uh, circumferential traction that you see here. So as we free more areas, then you use the cutter to again cut. Then again, as you see, we are indenting from the periphery to to uh, so that the periphery gets relaxed, and then we can remove all the vitreous uh, that that is there. And these high-grade PVR cases, you should remove everything as far as possible. 
so at the end we have relaxed everything i'm still uh, putting the dye to stain and check uh, for residual membranes as you can see here because um, even the seeming relaxation uh, uh, the kind of contraction this retina had uh, is, does not seem to be totally free of that so it's a good idea to free as much as possible uh, uh, the epiretinal component of these cases uh, before you finally uh, finish the case. And then, of course, do a, a good 360 laser and put uh, oil in such type of cases uh, and then give a prone positioning. A uh, situation to look at a subretinal band removal. Uh, now, subretinal bands don't always need to be removed, but wherever you feel that it's spanning in such a way that uh, it would cause traction or will keep the retina uh, held up uh, and not flatten, then you need to either remove it or or make sure that it's it's cut uh, or relaxed. So here I'm trying to remove it, but uh, as you see, it breaks at some point. So then you all you need to do is just uh, trim it and, and leave it so that uh, the continuous traction of the band is gone. And that's what is your aim at this stage. And this is the other end of the band where it uh, also uh, it had a potential and we are just trying to pull at it with suction of the cutter. Uh, as much as it comes out is fine. Otherwise, we just cut it and leave it uh, because the purpose was to, to, to just relax that area. Otherwise, there would have been a, 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 a traction inferiorly just because of that band in this case. But there are certain cases where the subretinal band uh, is spanning a certain area of the retina, but is not causing traction per se. So there you could just let it be. You don't have to go and uh, and remove it. So more often, I suggest <laughs> if you see a subretinal band which is holding up, go and just relax. Don't try all kinds of stunts to remove it uh, because uh, in doing so, sometimes uh, you may increase the size of the retinotomy that you make. Uh, there may be a bleed which may start. Uh, so best is to just cut and relax it uh, is, is what... I've learned over years and years of trying to remove these, uh, these bands. Now, this is a case of a, a complex case where uh, has been previously operated with oil inside and there is a PVR as well as subretinal oil uh, inferiorly uh, in, in this situation. So we have removed the oil, uh, the, the oil in the vitreous first, then I'm just putting some perfluorocarbon uh, which is helping me delineate the traction and I'm removing the central pucker, which allows the flattening of the central retina. And inferiorly, there is oil uh, subretinally. Now you can see that by injecting PFCL, I, I push passively that oil inferiorly to come out through that inferior break and, and, and it has come out. So of course, there's a contraction. At this stage, I do a diathermy to the inferior part uh, with an idea that I will do a large retinectomy as you've seen here. Uh, so that uh, it gets relaxed. So this is how you approach uh, these kind of cases uh, where you need to do a, a retinectomy. Now, this is another case uh, of, of uh, where we have removed the oil. Patient had come with recurrent PVR with inferior contraction, uh, which had come up. And uh, this is how, so we first removed the oil, put some perfluorocarbon in the center, and we are preparing a retinectomy. So I did diathermy. And after that, I'm cutting the area just above the diathermy uh, component, which is there so that there's no bleeding. Uh, essentially, what you're making is a giant tear. Uh, and, and the perfluorocarbon posteriorly is, is holding and keeping the posterior pole safe while you do this maneuver. Because sometimes there may be a bleed. Sometimes uh, there may be the contraction may extend. And the perfluorocarbon uh, is a great tool for such cases to hold the fort while you uh, are relaxing the peripheral part. You can see the previously lasered areas, the pigmented areas and the contracted areas. And once you're sure that uh, the retina is well flat, uh, it is basically behaving like a giant retinal tear now. Uh, so you fill more perfluorocarbon, after that do an air perfluorocarbon uh, exchange and then flatten the, the, the retina in this case. So, so these are some of the varieties that I was trying to show you or uh, from a simple retinal detachment, the various types of uh, detachments which come up and, and, and the strategy. And I showed you many similar cases at times so that uh, the technique is, uh, is, is, is sequentially uh, followed uh, and, and it's easy to remember that you first remove the vitreous, relax the retina, do an air fluid exchange, uh, do an endo drainage, do endo laser, cryo, and then give a tamponade based on what is there. 
and you use perfluorocarbons as a junk um, wherever you feel like. I use it a lot because I feel it's a great passive tool uh, to be used at various stages of the surgery. Uh, from simple cases to complex cases, it's a great tool uh, in, in all sorts of situations. It's a great savior. And, uh, and today, I can't imagine doing surgery without a, a tool like that. And of course, the, the great instrumentation in the form of uh, the finer gauges which have come, uh, the cutters, light pipes, the fluidics, uh, all these go a long, long way in, in, in making surgery uh, quite predictable to a large extent. Of course, we get complex cases and every case is different and, and may not turn out uh, exactly the way that we desire. But, but if you have a, a sequential way of looking at things uh, and, and tackling them, I think it makes uh, the whole approach uh, much simpler. At times, if it is too contracted, a funnel detachment, other things may not settle, or even if it settles anatomically, it may not make uh, much uh, functionally, it may not make much sense even if you put it back. But still, our aim is that we should be able to put back uh, all sorts of retinal detachments uh, as possible using all these techniques, adjuncts, uh, whatever uh, resources that we have together. So. So what I showed you was a sequence of cases from simple to complex. Uh, there's a lot more which can be done, but uh, I think that this is something that uh, would be a good platform to look at uh, this kind of a scenario. And uh, I would be happy to take in any questions uh, at this stage. I'll go through whatever Q and A's you've sent so far. Uh, this is a post-operative picture of uh, uh, one of these inferior retinectomy patients with. Uh, uh, laser done first post-op day, well settled under the oil. Of course, eventually this will get pigmented, scarred, and then we would remove the oil in this case. Uh, once again, I would like to thank Orbis for uh, facilitating this. I've had some uh, great times with Orbis in the past, and I look forward to working with them again actively, although uh, we've been working online uh, with a lot of things with CyberSight, and it's always a pleasure to collaborate uh, with them and would love to continue doing so. Um, and get back on the plane again once in a while whenever I get a chance. Thank you very much. Okay, so let me look at whatever the Q&A are there so far and feel free to uh, type anything that comes to your mind. Okay, so the first question is for this fakey guy, why you didn't use scleral buckling? So, okay, so... I think this is a question which will keep coming. Why scleral buckling and why? I'm not sure I want to answer it because uh, that whole time period is gone where uh, we look at why not scleral buckling and why this. I use scleral buckling in a very select uh, group of cases where I'm happy doing because I have known scleral buckling uh, since the past. But today, I, I personally feel way more comfortable with vitrectomy, but I still continue to do so for certain cases. So. I'm not sure I would be able to answer your question as to why I didn't use scleral buckling. At times, I would use a, a, a belt buckle for PVR cases, do a vitrectomy. At times, I would use only a scleral buckle uh, for a classic inferior detachment with a couple of breaks inferiorly. So uh, I'm not sure if uh, that's a question which is relevant today uh, with the whole scenario. So uh, I, I don't think I can totally uh, say that I would do scleral buckling here and I would do this, but scleral buckling I would surely do for a young patient with just a single break, inferiorly dialysis patients. But for all the rest, uh, I pretty much now prefer vitrectomy for all the reasons concerned. I want to ask for pneumatic retinopathy. How do you do it? In which cases? I've done two cases. I didn't have good results, which finish. In Great. So, uh, personally, uh, I've not had great success with only pneumoretinopexy. I use pneumoretinopexy as an adjunct sometimes. Uh, uh, maybe if after a surgery, I feel there's some fluid and there's a break which is open, I put in. Uh, but classic pneumoretinopexy, I've not had great success in our cases. In the US, uh, uh, it's done in a large number, and I think they, they, they have good success with that procedure. But uh, personally, maybe the patients that we have, the positioning, uh, the understanding of all these things uh, is, is challenging. So I don't do much pneumatic retinopexy uh, per se in my cases. I would uh, straight away go to a surgical procedure with a more definitive outcome uh, in most of the cases that uh, we do. <laughs> do you use PFCL as short-term tamponade? Uh, 
Uh, yes, but not for um, normal detachments or uh, whatever. I've used it only for cases of bad traumas with a lot of bleeding uh, issues inside. If there's choroidals, uh, a lot of blood which is there in the subretinal space. Uh, so at the end of clearing up everything, if I feel that uh, there is still some residual blood which keeps trickling back, um, I would put perfluorocarbon, fill it up, um, close the case, do a 360 barrage at times before closing the case. And then um, uh, after 15, 20 days, come back in when the eye is totally quiet, uh, the blood eye is cleared up, uh, there's a good scarring of the, uh, the laser marks, go back and just do an exchange uh, of the PFCL. Uh, in the past, uh, before wide angle systems, uh, uh, I used to, used to use um, perfluorocarbon for giant retinal tears and leave them inside for 10 days and remove it. Uh, but uh, I've not done it for the last uh, 20 years now because the wide field viewing allows us to see the periphery laser well. Uh, before that, there was a challenge with those cases and we've done it. So uh, I don't use it for classic cases if you're asking me uh, as a short-term temporary for those cases. Jocelyn says, um, in very stiff and shortened, uh, no, before that, when is the ideal time for silicon oil removal? So, okay, so... Uh, ideal time, I would say any time after three months is good. A uh, lot of factors uh, can delay it at times. It depends. The patient sometimes is reluctant because he's just recovered vision and is seeing well and you say that you have to remove it. There is a 1%, 5% chance of sometimes a detachment, redetachment. So he wants to delay it sometimes. Or, or if you have a one-eyed patient, you may want to keep it longer. Um, one of the key factors I look for, in, in, especially in, in multiple times operated eyes with silicon oil, is the, is the tone of the eye, the IOP. At times, these patients have very low IOP. They have IOP of 10, 11, 12 with oil inside. Now, these are cases which you should be very scared of oil removal because the minute you remove oil, uh, they sometimes go into thysis because they probably have a ciliary shutdown because of multiple surgeries. And they are doing fine just because the oil is inside and keeping a pressure of 10, 11. So always make sure if the pressure is uh, 9, 10, 11, 12 or lower, uh, be wary of just an oil removal. I mean, look at replacing the oil, if at all it's emulsified. And of course, on the other spectrum is uh, high IOP. Uh, because of that, at times you have to remove the oil early also. So if there's emulsification, high IOP, all these factors, I sometimes remove it early. But... Averagely, any time between three to six months is, is when we are removing the oil uh, in these cases. In uh, Jocelyn says, in very stiff and shortened retina, do you encounter retinal rip during air fluid exchange? How do you prevent this? Yeah, good question. So, uh, first of all, uh, before you do air fluid exchange, try to remove uh, vitreous as much as possible so that you already reduce the chance of the uh, the contraction persisting because of an epiretinal component, a vitreous component. Uh, then, of course, if there is a shortening or a traction within the retina, you need to look at it. And that's why uh, in my videos, I showed you that I, I like to put some perfluorocarbon on the posterior pole and see how the retina is behaving. If it is flattening well right up to the <clears throat> equator or periphery, then, then pretty much show that the contraction is not, not that bad. But if you feel that as you're injecting, even at near the arcades or, or just beyond, the retina is still not, not flattening well, then you know that it's stiff and, and you probably need to look at uh, either there's a subretinal component or there's a contraction. If there's a subretinal component, you could go and release it uh, because you've already released the epiretinal contraction. But if it's an intraretinal contraction, uh, then the only option is that you prepare for a, uh, for, for a retinectomy uh, in, in, in the clock hours that you feel will relax it. So prepare it, put some perfluorocarbon up to the edge of that area, uh, like I showed you in the video. Uh, do a good diathermy so that there's no bleeding and then cut it and relax it and relax it a few clock hours beyond uh, uh, the actual area of traction or contraction because uh, you sh the retina should be more relaxed in those clock hours by, uh, and, and don't... Uh, kind of do only a minimal retinectomy for those cases. Any tips to prevent slippage in GRT, even in PFCL silicon oil exchange? Okay, so in GRTs after the PFCL is inside and you've done your laser and you want to do the exchange, there are two things. One is you can go to air and then go to oil, 
or you could do a direct exchange. Now, I personally prefer going to air. So I make sure that I dry the edges very well and I don't do the exchange by going to the disc and, and removing the PFCL. I first dry up all the periphery, especially make sure the edges of the tear are dry and then gradually remove the PFO. Uh, then the slippage doesn't occur. Uh, but if you go straight to the disc and aspirate the PFO, you are sure to get slippage in these cases. So one has to be careful. But if you do a direct exchange, then uh, chances of slippage are anyways less. So if, if I don't think in that the slippage is a big issue uh, if you are used to doing a direct exchange. Okay, so how long do you leave PFO in long standing? No, I don't uh, leave PFO uh, for any detachment uh, in, in uh, as a post-operative uh, measure. I just put it intraoperative and remove it at the end of surgery. How is the way to make a good retinectomy? What is the ideal location? Location is based on um, uh, is is based on uh, uh, where the traction is, how many clock hours, and as I said, extend it a few more clock hours on both sides, uh, and and then uh, release the traction. And make sure you have perfluorocarbon supporting posterior to it, because uh, otherwise sometimes a bleed or something may go towards trickle towards the macula and make uh, surgery more difficult for you. What are your do's and don'ts for vitrectomy in high myopic eyes uh, <laughs> with adherent vitreous bands? So myopic eyes are always a, a big challenge, uh, especially very high myopic where the, the length is too much at times and instruments are not able to reach at times. Uh, so they are always a challenge. But there's nothing like a do's and don'ts. You take the same approach as you would do for any other eye, except that, as I said, sometimes there could be a challenge of reaching and, and you sometimes have to take off the cannulas and get that extra few millimeters of, uh, of, of length on the instruments or use a 23 gauge, which where the instruments are a bit longer uh, in those cases uh, to do or use a soft tip cannula to aspirate wherever you can instead of a cutter. So you kind of, and also one other thing that you need to do is uh, use transcendulone for sure in these cases, because sometimes even though you feel you've removed the vitreous, uh, uh, the hyaloid, uh, and there's a liquefied vitreous and you feel you've removed it, but there could be a sheet of uh, vitreous still lying on the surface of the retina, which would be applying traction. So so uh, always make sure uh, after doing vitrectomy, just put in a little triamcinolone, check for that, and, and then remove it. If the vitreous peripheral circumferential adhesions are very strong, then you have to trim and leave them. Uh, you cannot, if you are not able to remove the hyaloid as you have to just trim and leave them. So sometimes if you anticipate, uh, you could also put a belt buckle uh, if you feel as a support to these cases, uh, but I don't think it's a must for every case, but sometimes younger patients, younger myops uh, can be a challenge in these uh, situations. Would you prefer fake heat vitrectomy or buckling? Well, uh, as I said, if it's a young patient with clear lens, I would uh, choose buckling uh, with a single break, inferior dialysis, those kind of breaks. But all other situations, uh, I, I would choose uh, vitrectomy today because uh, I think our, we've been using so much vitrectomy, the instrumentation, everything is so much different now that we're getting more and more used to handling it uh, much better today. And even the cosmetic results are better uh, with it as we stand today. But certain cases, as I said, young kids uh, with peripheral breaks, I think buckling, uh, if you can do, is, is preferred uh, for the same reason that the, the lens uh, does not get compromised. Do you do FACO with the uh, vitrectomy in fake patients with high myopia and anterior breaks? No, unless the lens has cataractus, uh, we would not specifically do a FACO for this purpose alone. Uh, only if the lens is showing some cataract, uh, significant cataract, we would do a combined. Otherwise, would uh, leave the lens inside. And as I said, at times you indent from outside, bring the periphery to the central part so that you don't touch the, the lens and leave. Because the lens also acts as a good compartment at times if you are going to put oil or something, uh, instead of uh, uh, instantly changing that whole spectrum. Uh, so leave the lens inside let the retina settle and you could always do a, a cataract with, with your uh, oil removal or, or a cataract surgery uh, later on uh, once the retina is well settled. 
what is your approach for retinal detachments with choroidal detachments also do you operate it or give oral steroids before surgery no we straight away operate it i think that whole concept of uh, trying to wait with the choroidal once there is a retinal detachment uh, give steroids is gone now you have to go in as much as fast as possible because these cases have potential to uh, go into pvr very soon uh, much faster than usual cases and so uh it's best that uh, you go in early if the choroidal is significant you could also drain it externally uh during that surgery if it is mild you could just uh let it be uh in fact it it gives a good buckle effect uh, at times uh, in the areas of the break so uh, a choroidal is like a temporary buckle and, and leave it at that so uh it's a good idea to leave it but i if if the choroid is significant i would give a subtenon kenacort at the end of surgery uh for sure but i would not delay the surgery uh with oral steroids for uh, these cases what is your tamponade of choice for inferior detachments yeah so preferably uh, if if there's multiple breaks if it's a, a slightly long standing detachment multiple breaks i would use oil if it's a very fresh detachment with a single inferior break uh, uh if uh, if i am not doing a buckling because of a young patient i would put uh, gas in that also but if there is multiple breaks or long standing i would put oil for 3 months and then remove tour de force of rd pvr surgery what is your thought on using of intraoperative mitomycin c in complex as prophylaxis i don't have a personal experience of using this but i do know of some colleagues who've used it also in the uk they did a large study of these uh, cases uh, but as of today we don't have a good data to say that using this will prevent uh, uh, pvr and and so i'm not uh, convinced uh, in terms of the whole concept uh, and we still don't have a good solution to saying that oh this will prevent pvr so i'm not using anything except that if i do large retinectomies or if i uh, if it's a high grade pvr if there's choroidals i would put a subtenon kenacord at the end of surgery uh, with the idea that the overall inflammation is much less Uh, uh within the eye in the post operative period uh when do you remove subretinal bands in pvr yes so i uh, during my case i already said that i would remove it only if i feel that the retinal band is responsible for tenting the retina and, and will not flatten because of that if it is a a band which is flattening with the retina then leave it alone uh, and and pfcl may be very good to check it if you are in doubt you can put let the pfcl go on top of the area of the band and if if the retina flattens well don't bother removing it and if you feel that as it's getting close to the band and uh, and and it it tends to lift then you can reduce the pfcl and then make a retinotomy uh, in the in the cent in the most prominent area you may try to remove it if you like uh, but you, if you just snip it in between uh, it will be great also because it would have relaxed that uh, that that retina to go back what is the lens viewing system and recording camera so i use a sony hd uh, camera three chip as and the lens viewing is contact based uh, woke lenses which i use uh, the hrx uh, uh, wide field uh, lenses that uh, uh, are mini quad xl and the hrx lenses contact based uh, which i have used for, uh, for since they've been there and i am very happy using them is there any way to escape rd due to high myopia as myopia continuously increases is something which is alarming do we have any studies to reduce no rd is something which is a spontaneous event and i don't think you can prevent it uh, if it has to occur uh, you can follow up these patients you can uh, look at high risk factors in terms of family histories and look at them carefully if they have tears or holes you can do a prophylaxis but i am not somebody who does prophylaxis for pigmented lattice or 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 lesions other than a frank tear or a, or a frankly developed hole uh, in a non pigmented lattice uh, there is no data which suggests that if you laser a pigmented lattice uh, in a myopic eye it would prevent so so i am very conservative with prophylaxis and do it only for very specific indications and also of course other eye of a patient having a detachment you may want to prof- do prophylaxis to certain lesions there uh, but apart from that i would be conservative uh, and a good follow up is is uh, mandatory and you need to explain the patients about flashes floaters and sudden symptoms and they should come early to you
<laughs> any tips to operate cases of FEVR with RRD? Well, uh, those are always going to be difficult cases, just like ROP. Uh, they will come in all types of different spectrums. And I don't think I have a fixed tip about it. You have to look at uh, how the retina is, uh, what kind of membranes, what kind of contractions are there and do it. But personally, uh, they don't do very well, uh, except in, if you're lucky and you have cases where uh, the macular area is, is, is good and you have dissections in the peripheral areas, which would flatten. Uh, so I'm not sure specifically <laughs> uh, what you're uh, asking. And here we can't exchange uh, 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 pictures or anything. So uh, it's difficult for me to answer a specific question like that. Do you routinely peel ILM for RRD with choroidal detachment? No, I don't do it for uh, choroidal detachment. I would do it only if I see a pucker or a, or some sort of a contraction uh, uh, or a wrinkling uh, over the macular area. I would do it, but not because there is a choroidal detachment uh, 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 with it, uh, not for that. At this stage, I would like to thank all of you for uh, participating in uh, asking me all these questions. And I wish uh, we could have a, a dialogue with, with, with more pictures, but this is probably the best uh, at this point of time. And I thank Orbis to facilitate once again um, this forum. And, and it's been a pleasure and I look forward to doing this sometime again. And please feel free to send questions later if anything comes to your mind. Uh, I would be happy to uh, get back to you on that. Thank you very much.